Hey, it's James from Marketing for Restaurants, and welcome to episode 50 of Secret Sauce, the restaurant marketing podcast. Your restaurant story, your restaurant brand, and your restaurant's intellectual property. Building and protecting your story to increase profitability. Some restaurants are quiet, lose money, and the owner works 70 hours a week. Other restaurants are busy, profitable, and the owners work a few hours a day. What's the difference? They have a secret sauce. Join James from Marketing for Restaurants as he helps you come up with your recipe for restaurant success. Your secret sauce. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. Wow. Episode 50. It's been quite a journey to get to episode 50. It's been super exciting. We've spoken to some amazing people. And it's amazing. The thing that I am really quite humbled about is the relationships that this podcast has built with restaurant owners all around the world. Every week, people are hitting us up in LinkedIn, on Facebook to ask us a question about a specific podcast or just to let us know how they're going with it. So thank you very much for everyone who's contributed or made a comment or shared one of the posts. If you are loving the podcast, please leave a review in iTunes. And when you see one of the ads for one of the podcast episodes come up, if you think it's a good episode, just please share it. It really does help the story get out. We produce these free and we try and share as much information as we can about the lessons that we're learning every day as our team is doing restaurant marketing for customers in, and I think we're in 10 countries, which is amazing and really exciting. So today we're going to be talking about your story. A lot of people put a lot of effort into creating a great restaurant story. A lot of people put a lot of effort into building their restaurant brand. That's all part of the intellectual property that you've got around your business. And we're going to be talking about building and protecting your story to increase profitability because this is one of the things, it's a fundamental part of the marketing that so many people miss out on and it really does create massive issues for them. I have seen people's business shut because I have seen people in tears, I have seen people laying off staff because they have missed one of these things. We had someone who who was talking to us and they said, you know, it was just really tough. And I went and had a look at it and you could see, you could see the issues that all that they had all through the process about managing their intellectual property. And the really, really sad thing was that these things could have been fixed with probably half an hour, an hour, no cost whatsoever. But this restaurant owner just didn't know what they were looking for. They didn't know what it was that they needed to be thinking about and they didn't know. And even if they had found them out, they wouldn't have known what steps it was to take out. So before we get into that though, um, I've got a little interesting story. So I live in Melbourne. One of our local papers is The Age. And in my Facebook uh, feed this morning, there was an article from The Age, the 20 best cafes for brekkie in Melbourne. Um, it was about two degrees when I went for a run this morning, and I would have liked to have gone out to have a decent brekkie. Interesting list of cafes. As a restaurant marketer, I, I was looking for what is the marketing angle on this. So the thing is that these restaurants have gone and put together a great story. Now, Because you've got to think about it, when the writer for The Age... So Danny Vallant, one of the writers at Good Food, which is one of the related companies, has come up with this list. Those restaurants have gone, they've created a story partially around their food, partially around the experience, the value that they create, the way that their front of house staff are trained, the way that they present themselves, the ingredients that they use, the location that they've got, the view from the restaurant, the history of the restaurant, all of those sort of things sort of come together to tell a story. And a lot of restaurants have got great stories. They're not very good at telling it. These restaurants are probably pretty good at telling their story because of the fact that they've been viewed as being good enough to be listed in a list of the 20 best cafes in Melbourne. Now, hopefully those cafes had a really busy morning today as people woke up just as I did, saw that article and thought, you know what, let's go out for brekkie. Let's try this cafe. It's pretty close by. 
the thing I found really interesting, so as soon as I came to work, I loaded up the article and then I went through and I looked at the websites for the 20 cafes that were there. And there was something that I found really interesting. So four of them didn't even have a website, just relying on a Facebook page. So Danny has gone through and grabbed their Facebook page and included that link. Now, that can work. You know, that definitely can work. And, you know, they might be, well, I didn't check Instagram, so they might be crushing it on Instagram. I only had a quick look at their Facebook page. One had 1,400 likes, uh, two of them had 2,700 likes, and one had 900 likes. Now, that's not a really good indication of how good their Facebook marketing is because they may or may not have bought likes, but, you know, they're probably doing an above average job of their Facebook. But one of the interesting things is that they don't have a website. Now, The next step that I looked at, for those that did have a website, only one of them had the Facebook Pixel installed. Only one of those websites. So five of the 20 cafes that were listed in that list, one in 20, only 5% had the Facebook Pixel installed on their website. Now, to me, that is absolutely crazy. The Facebook Pixel for us is a fundamental part of the marketing that we do to build relationships with our customers. So If you don't know how that works, you should probably go back and have a listen to some of the advanced Facebook marketing techniques. We did a whole podcast just on the Facebook pixel and how it can help you to retarget your customers. And this is the really important thing. As you're trying to build a brand, you're going to put a picture out of your smashed avocado or whatever it is. You might have come up with something really innovative. If you've got a strong brand, people are going to take that up a lot more readily. So how do you build a strong brand? And it's by repeated exposure. And probably the easiest way to get that repeated exposure is to target the same people over and over and over in Facebook. When someone goes to your website, if you've got the Facebook pixel installed, you can create a custom audience that can target everyone who's gone to your website. And so if you're getting a thousand people to your website every month, you might find that 70% of those people are logged into Facebook, which means over six months, you're going to have 5,500 people in that target audience, which means that they're people who are aware of your restaurant. You're going to get a lot better traction with any ad that you run to people who are in that audience. It's a really simple and definitely well-proven way of running highly effective Facebook campaigns. And I think that this is something that everyone needs to be thinking about And a really fundamental part of the way that you can start to build a pipeline of people who are interested in your restaurant, who may even be customers, but you just don't have their email address. So these are 20 cafes who have great stories. Obviously, they've been high enough on the radar to get that written up. The sad thing is that all of those people who've gone to that website, if they'd had the pixel installed, they could then retarget them. And so you remember, we were in that, that list of the top 20 restaurants. Oh, cafes, maybe you want to come back. Maybe you want to try this food. Maybe you should try what we've got on this week in our special. Oh, yeah, I remember those guys. I haven't got around to getting to them. You know, everyone's busy. You need that opportunity to go back and hit them up again and say, you know, remember us? We're still here. We've still got some awesome food. Perfect for coming out on a Saturday morning. That message over and over and again, sooner or later you start to get traction with it and those customers come in. And if you are doing a really, really good job, then you've got a really, really good chance of turning them into a repeat customer. And that's part of the process about finding new customers and turning them into repeat customers. So we thought a little bit about a story. These guys have great stories. How does that relate to intellectual property? And like, well, first off, what is intellectual property? So and all I did was Google this off Wikipedia. So it's the creation of intellect for which a monopoly is assigned to designated owners by law. Intellectual property rights are the protections granted to the creators of intellectual property that include trademarks, copyright, patents, industrial design rights, and some jurisdictions, trade secrets. Artistic works including music and literature, as well as discoveries, invention, words, phrases, symbols, and designs can all be protected as intellectual property. Okay. The other thing that I'd like to talk about is is an intangible asset. So that's an asset which lacks a physical substance. Unlike physical assets, so your ovens, that is a physical asset. And if you own it, that, that would be a part of the business that would appear on the balance sheet. An intangible is something that you can't touch. And it's usually very hard to evaluate. It includes patents, copyrights, franchises, goodwill, trademarks, and trade names. 
The general interpretation also includes software and other intangible computer-based assets. Contrary to other assets, though, generally, they not necessarily suffer from typical market failures of non-rival and non-excludability. Now, some of these intangible assets you are going to buy when you buy a restaurant. Just think about that. If you're buying a space and you're going to do a Chinese restaurant or an Indian restaurant and there's a pizza restaurant in there, then you don't really care about the name of the restaurant. You don't really care about their customer database or any of those sort of things. But one of the things that I see happen, because we quite often, you know, we'll get customers. In fact, I had a customer email us this week saying that we're looking to sell. What are some things that we can start thinking about? So we went through a process to help them to be able to present the restaurant in the best possible light. Now, if you're buying a restaurant and you plan on keeping the name, then you should be looking to get these intangible assets. You should be looking for things like the domain name, the email list, because these might be fundamental parts of the profitability of the restaurant. If you're buying a restaurant and they've been sending out emails to an email list of 10,000 people on a monthly basis and they get a, let's say, an 8% response rate, that's 800 people who are coming in. And you know how the figures go by now, three and a half people for each booking, that's 2,400 people booking. And, you know, so that's probably $100,000 in monthly revenue from that one email. Rough figures. Now, that business is built on, well, $1.2 million of that annual revenue is built on that email list. And it is so easy for the owner to omit that from the fact that they've got this, they've got this massive email list. He might be going to build a restaurant in another location. He might be planning on selling a very successful restaurant, but then he's planning on keeping the email list emailing every one of those customers and saying, hey, I've moved to a new restaurant and, you know, this is the new menu, he might actually then be taking those customers from you who potentially might have a right to those customers. It would be very disappointing if you were buying the the restaurant and the price factored in that $1.2 million that was being generated by email marketing and you didn't get that email list. So what are some of the issues that you can run into around intellectual property. And the first one that we see is domain addresses. So the rights to the actual domain for the website. And I I actually, we've been meaning to do this. I've been writing notes down about intellectual property for quite a while, but this one bubbled up to the top because a restaurant got a renewal notice from Menulog. Actually, I think it was Eat Now, but there are both the same company this week. And their website's not with them their website's with us and they are using our online ordering system and they were like, why am I getting this from Eat Now? And our team went through it and we had a look at it and it's like, well, because they own your domain name. And she said, well, how could that be? And it's like, well, because they've registered it, you didn't have a website and when we created the website, you didn't go through the process to get the the domain ownership of that domain transferred to you. Now, I personally think that that's a pretty dodgy practice to go registering a domain name on for a restaurant when you're not that restaurant. So, and you can generally get it transferred fairly easily. These people hadn't gone through that process. And we actually, we do this quite a bit because it's a very, very common occurrence. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, how that can be a problem a little bit later in the podcast. The next thing that we see as being a problem is your Facebook page. So quite often you'll see that the Facebook page is owned by, as far as Facebook sees it, is owned by someone who who isn't in the ownership team. And the way that this generally pans out is that a staff member will say, we don't have a Facebook page, we should create a Facebook page. And the, the owner who's 65 years old says oh yes you know all the kids are on Facebook we should do that and then the employee comes up and says oh here have a look at the Facebook page oh that's great lots of people are coming in I recognize those customer names this is fantastic this is really good then the employee leaves or something happens and they can just forget 
the fact that they're the owner of the Facebook page. I have also seen it where an employee gets sacked for poor performance and they think that their performance was awesome and then they don't like the restaurant owner and they don't like the people who still work at the restaurant. And so they start posting up things that are definitely not in the best interest of the restaurant. Now the restaurant is in a really awkward position because they've got Facebook posts that are, you know, very derogatory to the brand of the restaurant. And they have to then go through a process where they have to say, well, actually, no, we didn't create it, but we are the actual owner of the Facebook page. That's my restaurant. So you need to transfer ownership to me. That's a difficult and complicated process. So whenever you're creating a Facebook page, you should make sure that if you're the owner of the restaurant, you should be the owner of that page. You can delegate out responsibilities to people so people can put posts up and you might want to delegate that really low. My personal opinion is that you should have someone on each shift who is had 30 minutes worth of training on Facebook. They know the kind of things that they should be looking for in, in a, to do a Facebook post and they should be allowed to post it. You don't want to get an email. Oh, here's a photo from two weeks ago of some guy who came in and I thought it was a good photo. Can you please put it up on Facebook? The guy comes in, it's up on Facebook. He knows that it's on Facebook and he likes it himself and tags himself in on, uh, at the restaurant. That's the way that you should be doing Facebook marketing. If you're not going to be there every single hour of the week then you need to delegate that out. And I think that that's the way that you want to go. You know, obviously be careful who you delegate it out to and monitor the kind of posts that they're putting up there. You can always edit those posts. That's not a problem. And by using things like Pages Manager, it's in your pocket. It's with you all the time. You can monitor it from anywhere in the world. Nice and simple. So much easier to control than having a Facebook page that is owned by someone else. You've got no control over that. Now, the next thing when it comes to Facebook um, pages is that if you have made a decision and look, a lot of restaurants will say, you know what, we don't get Facebook, we don't understand it, we don't think it's worth time, it's going to waste too much time and effort, we're not going to have a Facebook page. Well, I'm sorry, but it doesn't work like that because Facebook decided that you're going to have a Facebook page. This comes as a bit of a shock to people. Here is your Facebook page. Oh, we never created one. I know. Facebook created it for you. They thought, who in their right mind wouldn't have a Facebook page? And I kind of agree with them. But who in their right mind wouldn't have a Facebook page? Obviously, this is an omission. What what they want is they want people to be able to say, I'm at Bob's Pizza Place. Bob hasn't created a Facebook page. That's fine. We'll create one for him. Now, everyone who goes to Bob's Pizza's Place, you know, they can check in, they can write reviews, they can do all of those sort of things that Facebook want their users to be able to do. This can be a bit of a problem. Now, in a very, very similar vein, you've got your Google My Business page. So Google creates a page for you out of the information that it has about your restaurant. Now, they might get it from the website, they can get it from a range of sources, But I think there's a couple of things that are really important here. The first thing is that Google uses that information to present to people in the Google Knowledge Graph. So if someone Googles Bob's Pizza Restaurant, it's going to put the, it's going to say, well, this this guy's after Bob's Pizza Bar. So what we're going to do is we're going to get all of the information that we know about this place and we're going to put it on the right hand side of the Google search results. So there'll be the name, there'll be a link to the website if there is one, there'll be directions to where the restaurant is. There will be reviews because don't forget Google does reviews as well and we all need more companies aggregating customer reviews, don't we? He said sarcastically. But there will be reviews there. There is a whole heap of information. There are opening times, contact details. All of that sort of information is there in the Google Knowledge Graph. There's also some photos in there and a link to the menu and as well as if you do online bookings, a link for bookings, if you do online ordering, a link to do online orders. Now, if you're not running this, if you haven't linked your website to a Google My Business account, then Google is trying to work out what the opening hours are. And they've actually got a program where they'll say, oh, it looks like you're at Bob's Pizza Restaurant. Is this the opening hours? Do they have off-street parking? It will go through to Google reviewers and ask them a series of questions to try and tidy up the the information that they've got. 
But there's a couple of issues there because I know that I've been asked, you know, what's the opening times here? It's like, I don't know. So I'll, I'll skip that. But you're relying on the general public to go and put that information in. That may not be the best result for you. The other thing that's really important is you are relying on the good intentions of people. And some people don't have good intentions. We've all seen the dodgy review that says that Bob's Pizza Restaurant is the worst pizza restaurant ever. And I had a I had a Hawaiian pizza and I got violently ill and had diarrhea and vomiting and I thought I was going to die. We've all seen that review. And we've all seen the response, you know, and the review says I went in on Monday night and, and had the Hawaiian pizza. And then you see the response from Bob and it goes, hey, it's Bob here. That's really interesting. We're not open on Monday nights. So not everyone's got the best intentions or your best intentions at heart when they write those reviews. Now, the scary thing is that you could actually go in. A member of the public could say, well, Bob's Pizza Restaurant's closed. Now, when anyone Googles Bob's Pizza Restaurant, and I'm not talking about closed now, I'm talking about permanently closed. When anyone searches that, on the Google Knowledge Graph, it's going to come up in red lettering, permanently closed. And this is one of those things that was so sad that I've actually seen impacting someone's business. And as they're going through the motions of winding up the restaurant, before it had actually closed, it was like, well, it does say on Google that you're permanently closed. And it's like, we haven't closed yet. And it's like, no, but Google says that you're permanently closed. And they said, well, how did it know? And it's like, well, how long has it been like that? And they said, well, I don't know. Now, why would you call a restaurant that's permanently closed? Unless you've driven past and, well, hang on a sec, I, I saw that they were open today. Even if you drove past a week ago or a month ago, oh, that's sad. I was planning on going there this weekend. I think most people are pretty unlikely to pick up the phone and say, Google saying that you're closed. Are you really closed? No, you're just closed. Closed, closed, closed. Now, and this is because they hadn't taken control of the Google My Business. They hadn't linked the information that was going up on that Google knowledge graph with the information that was actually about their restaurant. And this is why it's such a fundamentally important thing to make sure that you're controlling all of these little bits of pieces that interact with your intellectual property because it can have a massive impact on your business. The same thing, the very same thing happens with Facebook as well. You can claim this restaurant. Is this your business? You can claim it. Yes, it's my business. And it's closed. Sorry about that, everyone. And it doesn't, it may not be closed. It might be one of your competitors who wants to close it. So that's one thing that you really need to be thinking about, making sure that you've got control of your Facebook page, making sure that you've got your Google My Business page all set up. Now, one of the most important things that you can do to check the intellectual property of your business is to Google it. Now, what I like to do is, I was talking to a customer yesterday and he said, oh, it's interesting because one of the businesses we just bought, when I first looked at it, it was on the second page and I've looked at it now and it's on the first page. So it's slowly moving up. Well, is it slowly moving up? Because the thing was, I Googled it. I put the probably the exact same Google or search term into, into Google, which was the, just the name of the business. And that for me, they were on page two. Google keeps a history of the things that you're looking for. And if you've looked for it and clicked through on previous occasions on multiple times, it's probably thinking, you know what, he's looked for Bob's Pizza Restaurant five times. On the previous four times, he's clicked through to Bob's Pizza Restaurant. You know what he's after? I reckon it's Bob's Pizza Restaurant. It will show it to you higher than it really is. So one of the things to do is to look at it in an incognito window. So if you've got Chrome, there's a little arrow in the top right-hand corner, just under the X, under that new incognito window. Click on that and it brings up a a page and it says you've gone incognito and there's like a stylized set of glasses with a bit of a hat on. Incognito mode is used for people who don't want their browsing history tracked. But the reason why I use it is because Google won't reference your online profile. So Google has a massive profile about all of the things that I'm interested in based on the things that I've been Googling. If I'm Googling to find out where one of our restaurants is, I don't want to use a normal browser where Google, because Google knows that I'm looking for that restaurant. I want to see what just the normal public would get. And so the first thing that you want to do, so open the incognito window and then just Google your restaurant. 
you should be doing pretty well for your restaurant name. But the thing that is scary is that there's often things that can sort of trip you up. First thing that you should be thinking about is, you know, where do you end up on the search rankings? The second thing that you want to be looking for is for fake websites, because this is where your intellectual property, your brand is being, could be at risk. So one of the things that we see all the time when we Google for a restaurant that's come to us for help around either finding new customers or turning them into repeat customers is that, and and the typical example will be, let's stick with Bob's Pizza Restaurant and Bob's URL, you know, his website is at bobspizza.com. Okay, so that's what you're kind of expecting to see. Let's just say it's in San Francisco. The scary thing is when you Google Bob's Pizza, one of the things that will come up is bobspizzasanfrancisco.com. This is a brand jacking website. So this is someone has registered a domain name. Now, they wanted to get Bob's Pizza because that's the actual domain name, but that wasn't available. So they've registered Bob's Pizza San Francisco. And we see this all the time. It's usually an online ordering company. And what they do is they create a website that is very similar. It'll be their standard default website, which just has the menu. There might be a map. There might be a couple of reviews on there, but it's a literally a glorified menu page. That's it. And because of the fact that a lot of people don't do a very good job with, with SEO, their website probably comes up higher than your website does. Particularly, and so we see Menulog doing a lot of this in Australia. Menulog will have a link from their website. Now, Menulog is used by millions of people. So it's a very highly trafficked website. Any link out of that is relatively well regarded by Google. So that then means that your Bob's Pizza, Frankston or Bob's Pizza Seafood, wherever it is, whatever the location is of it, that will come up higher than your one. And the scary thing is that then you've got customers who think that they're ordering direct from you are actually ordering from Bob's Pizzas, San Francisco or Melbourne or whatever it is, whatever the dodgy website that they've created is. Now, why do people do this? So in online ordering, because of the fact that they're probably taking anywhere between 10 and and 35% of the order value, what they want to be able to do is they want to, because what we're starting to see is because we've been talking about this for so long that you shouldn't be charged for orders that come through your own website. Some of them have started to do these deals where oh, we'll, we'll charge you 5% as a handling fee if it comes from your own website or, or 10% and we'll charge you more if it comes from someone else. Or they'll often just mark it as, you know, this came from our network and this came from your website. And I think that's what Menulog does. I'm not sure, but I I don't think they're charging a different price yet. What they want to be able to do is say, well, you know, through our website, and and they're not going to say, oh, which is bobspizzafrankston.com.au. They're not going to say, oh, we created a fake one to trick customers into it. They're just going to say "Through, through our website, we generated... 75, 80, 90% of the, of the orders. And it's interesting because when a customer moves across to our free online, free restaurant online ordering system, they've said that they've got customers who say, oh, you know, don't forget to order direct from us and because and, you can save or, you know, we'll offer you something special or whatever the order is. And they say, oh, but I did order direct from you. And it's like, no, you didn't. You ordered from Menulog. The customers don't actually understand it. And this is, so in the industry, it's called brand jacking. It's like hijacking, but they're taking your, they're they're inserting themselves in between you and your customer and they're hijacking your brand. So the customer thinks that they're dealing direct with the restaurant when in reality, they're actually dealing direct with Menulog. And of course, what's the intellectual property of your restaurant? You know, it's going to be things like your email list. We talked about the restaurant was sending out 10,000 emails. You're not that guy because you're not getting the emails from those customers. And if you're not getting the emails, then you're, being incredibly lax in the marketing things that you should be doing. Because I've got to tell you, if you've got an email list of 10,000 customers who've eaten at your restaurant before and thought the value was there and thought that the food was there was good, then it's trivial to get those people to come back. It's really easy. If you're not collecting those emails, then you're never going to be able to send out an email to 10,000 customers who love your food. Which restaurant would you want to be? And seriously, if you're sending out to 10,000, you could be making $1.2 million in extra revenue over a year. 
not a month. It'd be nice to be able to do that in a month. You'd need a high volume kitchen though. So this is one of those things. You're doing that Google search and you're looking for the kind of things that are coming up. Now, the next thing to do is to have a look at the Google knowledge graph. When the transcript goes up, I'll get the team to put some photos in of some of the issues that we've seen. So Dimmy is quite nefarious for this. Oh, now, sorry, before we move on to that, the other thing is who else is above you? So you'll often find if you Google Bob's Pizza, you'll often find if you're using an online ordering system or a online booking system that charges, then you'll often see their ad above your restaurant. So they'll say, oh, we're going to partner with you and, you know, just help you take bookings online, which, and on the face of it, that sounds really good. That's a no-brainer. But the problem is, and this, you know, this is a fundamental problem, is that their business-to-consumer businesses, they use restaurants for service delivery, whether it's for a booking, uh, you know, so the service is a seat, or whether it's an online order, because these guys often don't really care where those go. They just want to make sure that people make a booking, and they want to make sure that people make an order. So, they will run an ad and I'm hoping to do an interview with someone who f- who really understands this and, and really understands how nefarious it is for restaurants. But it's called AdWords Arbitrage. And so let's use the, the example of Dimmy because they, they do quite a bit of this in Australia. Open Table does quite a lot of it in the United States. And so we've read quite a few articles and and talk to the guys the guys at talk are all over this because they compete quite a bit with open table and we're starting to push up against open table both here in australia and in the united states and restaurants are, are complaining about some restaurants are saying but i get so much comes from the open table network or so much comes from the dimmy network and the interesting thing is when you show them what edwards arbitrage is and and a lot of people don't understand it which is why i'm taking the time to go through it today so that you can understand. Now, imagine this scenario. You've signed up with Dimmy or or OpenTable. Now, Dimmy charge $1 if the booking comes per seat, $1 per seat plus a monthly fee. But let's just focus on the the per seat charge. So the per seat charge is $1 if it comes from your website. If it comes from the Dimmy network, then they'll charge you $3. So what they'll do is they will run an AdWords campaign because they know that people are going to click on that. You know, they see it and it's like, an, and the ad looks like it's your restaurant. The ad takes them to Dimmy and you make a booking for 10 and before you know it, and the thing that is really sad about this is it's probably a, uh, often it's a repeat customer. And if it's a repeat customer, Dimmy's done no marketing whatsoever. All they've done is once again, brand hijack that they're, they're trading off your great brand name people have said i would like to go to you know bob's pizza tonight bob's pizza goes into google bang up comes the google adwords and they click through the dimmy website they make a booking for 10 that's the a 30 dollar invoice to you there's two problems with that one of course you've got to deal with no shows so if, if they decide to no show then you're 30 dollars out of pocket and you didn't even get any revenue whatsoever and on top of that, you probably held a table of 10 for them. So if you don't have a lot of walk-by traffic who you're able to fill it, you're actually out of pocket the $30 plus the table of 10, which, you know, I don't know what pizza restaurant, say 30 bucks, $30 per person on average. That costs you $330. Now, for $330, that's really going to put a dent into the profitability of the night, isn't it? At the end of the month, you get the invoice from Dimmy and Dimmy says, look at the Dimmy network. We generated a booking, this booking of 10 for you. Aren't we fantastic? When, and they've done that because what they could have done is they could have gotten a $10 fee if the booking had come from your website. But what they're trying to do is they might've paid Google $5, you know, anywhere between two and $5 for that click. Now, not everyone makes a booking, but if if half of the people who click through that make a booking, then they are able to, rather than getting a booking of and making $10, they're making $30. That $20 difference funds the AdWords campaign. And they get to build this dominant narrative about, look how good our marketing is. And the restaurants say, wow, this is amazing. 
the marketing is really fundamental to what it is that we do. And some restaurant owners get really upset about this when you explain it to them because they think, you know, they've been doing this for two or three years. They've been sharing their customer email details with Dimmy. Open Table, I don't think, share the emails. The online ordering guys, they definitely don't share the emails. So this creates a massive problem. You're bleeding out customer contact details to another company that's going to email out on behalf of other restaurants to your customers and you're paying for it. So you want to look and see if there are ad words up there. And one of the things that you can do, and look, if Dimmy wasn't an open table weren't doing this, I would say, you know, be in their network, let them do some marketing on behalf of your restaurant. But the problem is that they do this at AdWords arbitrage. So in general, you need to be out of their network entirely because then they're not going to run that AdWords campaign, which I think is sad because if they bring you a new customer, then that's exciting. And you'd be quite, I think you should be quite happy to pay for that. But because of this AdWords arbitrage issue, then it makes it very difficult to be able to justify the added cost in being in remaining in the network. Now, that's not the only place that you need to be looking at for your Google search. The other thing is in the Google Knowledge Graph. Because as I said before, there's the bookings and the online orders tab in that information. And one of the things that we've seen, and so we were um, working with a couple of restaurants recently where this had happened. You would Google the restaurant and there would be a, the, under the bookings thing, it would say Dimmy and you would click through there and they weren't even in Dimmy's booking system. And so Dimmy had a little page on their website that said, oh, you've tried to book at Bob's Pizza. Bob doesn't take pe- bookings through Dimmy. Try these other four restaurants that we think would be a good substitute for that. Now, we wrote a blog article about this recently, and I'll include a link to it. So Dimmy had a page for Bray, which is one of Australia's best restaurants. So Dan Hunter's the chef out there, does an amazing job, world-famous restaurant. And the thing that was really interesting about this is on the Dimmy page, it says, oh, looking to book Bray. Bray doesn't take online bookings with Dimmy. To book online, check out these great alternatives. Now, I'm not sure what sort of algorithm that they're using behind there, but there was a link. The number one restaurant that they thought was an alternative to Bray was Switch Lifestyle Fountain Gate. Now, don't want to say anything nasty about the guys at Switch because I'm sure that this wasn't a part of their thing, but that, that ain't no Bray, okay? So there's only one Bray. And as I said, you know, if it was a, if it was a said, oh, you know, Bray's not taking bookings. Have you thought about Attica? Have you thought about Restaurant Lume? They would have been two eminently defendable alternatives. But this is just a family restaurant, Switch Lifestyle and Fountain Gate. And on top of that, it's about 300 kilometers from Bray. It's nowhere near it. So you need to be thinking about that. So what they're trying to do is, is literally the old bait and switch. And they've got a page there. It, it says, live off the land. Some places can only be described as special. And Bray in Victoria's Baruga region is just that special. The modern restaurant, blah, 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 blah. That's the bit that comes up in the Google search result. Really quite scary. So, And that page has been put there so that they can then use the um, – insert that into the Google knowledge graph – to be able to get those those bookings. Now, I, I don't think, for the guys at Bray, I don't think that made any difference because if you're searching to book at Bray, you're going to book at Bray and you're not going to be dissuaded. You want to book at Bray and you're certainly not going to be booking at any other places. There's, there's a pub in Aries Inlet. Uh, there's a place in um, Ballarat. None of those, like there's only one Bray. So for them, it's okay. But for you, if you're running a local restaurant and you see four of your competitors up there, that can be really, really quite nasty. So same, same with um, Menulog, Just Eat, Grubhub, all of those guys. You want to make sure that none of those guys, that you've got your online ordering system in there and that that link in the Google Knowledge Graph is pointing towards your booking system, not somebody else's because they're just getting a free hit. You know, they're not doing any marketing. All they've done is inserted the information in there. And I think that it's really important that you sort of understand that and that you keep on the lookout for it. And this is why I think Googling yourself is so important. Now, with your online booking system, one of the things that I think, or online ordering system, one of the really, really powerful pieces of advice that we give restaurants is to make a booking at your own restaurant. Yes, you know, if it's free, then you're not going to receive a fee. 
if it's a monthly fee, you're not going to receive a fee. If it's per seat, then you are going to receive a fee. But I think it's really important that you do that. The best practice is to sign up for a Gmail account and that no one's ever used before, record the username and password, make the booking or the online order, and then in a month's time, go back and just check your emails. Because the thing is that a lot of restaurants are horrified when they find the kind of information that is sent to those email addresses. So offers to other restaurants, discounts to other restaurants. How can you build a loyal customer base? And this is, I've spoken about this numerous occasions. The first time Tina used Dimmy was for a Mexican restaurant in Melbourne and on the Thursday after that, she received a 50% offer from Dimmy to another Mexican restaurant that was 3.2 kilometres away. Now, it's 50% off. How can you build a loyal customer base when companies are sending 50% off coupons to your competitors to all of the people who've eaten at your restaurant? It's madness. It's really, really tough to build a loyal customer base when 50% coupons are on. And this is why these aggregators we think are really just Groupon by stealth. We all know how bad Groupon can be for a restaurant. You don't want to be using a Groupon by stealth kind of marketing. So that is about it. And I I think, you know, we could also talk about review sites as well. You know, you need to be on top of that monitoring what's going on or not. It depends on what your strategy is and how, how that's going to play in. But I think, you know, just sort of summing up, make sure that you have got a Facebook page that you've got control of. You don't want to lose control of your Facebook page. Make sure that you've got a Google My Business account set up. And in the show notes, I'll get one of the marketing team, you know, Jasmine, to put some links up on how to make sure that you've got control of your Facebook page and your Google My Business account. That's going to feed into the Google Knowledge Graph. And they're the kind of things that so many people are having trouble with. You don't want to be the restaurant that is marked as permanently closed in either Facebook or or even worse, on Google, because that will kill your restaurant quicker than anything, I think. It's probably the number one mistake that you can make. And the sad thing is, I've seen it happen. We had one probably about two months ago that we were able to, and she said, you know, business has just fallen off a cliff in the last six months, and I'm really, really struggling. And that one change made it. And it, it's not something that you, you can't just ring up Google and say, oh, no, we're open. Can you please fix it? takes a while for them to go through and sort everything out and that's quite scary you know it's particularly when revenue takes such a huge hit so quickly and this is one of the things to to really remember is the fact that you know a lot of people still are searching and you know you're not going to appear on a google map search if you're marked as permanently closed people aren't going to call you if you're marked as permanently closed Have a look for fake websites. Make sure that you're not bleeding customer details out to other companies that are going to be sending offers to other restaurants to your loyal customers. And I think that that's the really important thing. I just want to close with the story of last night. Last night, we, so I'm doing this on a Saturday. Last night was Friday night. You know that we love some home delivered food on a Friday night. And um, I'd floated the idea of Indian because everyone knows I love Indian food. Uh, That didn't go down too well. So I said, well, let's do something a bit different. And so we wanted, we decided on the on a rare occasion that we were actually going to do some pizza. I was going to get some – I got some ribs as well. It was interesting. I'm there with my son, Will, and we're sitting in the lounge room working out what we're doing and he's on menu log, I'm on menu log. We, we like to use our customers. And we've got a few who deliver to us, but we, we use them quite a bit, so we wanted to use something a bit different. Will was on one website, I was on the other – and we got this whole thing of, hang on a sec, which one are you looking at? Which one are you looking at? No, wait, hang on a sec, because we, oh, hang on, I've swapped, no, because there were two places with very similar names, and it was almost impossible, the menus were very similar, it was impossible to tell which one you were. We had to actually go, wait, hang on a sec, you stop, you stay at that one, I'm going to go and have a look at it. Menu Log does a really good job of creating a very level playing field, and all of the guys do this, from a booking point of view, and from a takeout online ordering point of view as well. They used the same strategy that Yellow Pages used when Yellow Pages was a thing. And that was they wanted to create a level playing field for everyone. They wanted everyone to get some results. But if you paid a lot more to them, then you would get a lot more orders. And so when the Yellow Pages person came around, they'd say, oh, you know, you had a quarter page color ad 
this time, why don't we go with a half page or, you know, really, you know, you should think about a full page ad because some of your competitors have got full page ads. You know, you'd get so many more customers if you had a full page ad. They wanted to split up all of the customers based on the the share of the revenue that they got. So they wanted to create a, and you know, if you had the yellow pages person doing your ad, they wanted to make sure that it was very bland. So it was literally just the color and the size of the ad that stood out. They didn't want to come up with a really amazing heading or a, or a super catchy image because that would have got you more customers than you were really entitled to. They just wanted you to have a full page ad that was full color and pick up most of the business in that. Menu log and the other guys do the same sort of thing. If you're willing to pay them a higher percentage of commission, if you're r- willing to run a paid ad on their platform, then they're willing to send so much more traffic towards you. If you're not then it's a very bland experience for everyone. It was almost impossible to differentiate between the two. And the sad thing is, you know, and once again, I've learned my lesson. The ribs that came, I got a, a ribs and chicken wing pack. The chicken wings were undercooked and the ribs were overcooked. I ate two of the ribs. I think there was 10 of them in the pack. The rest I gave to the dog because it was literally garbage. I was like, nah, I'm not going to be eating there again. A combination of a couple of things. We've spoken to um, quite a few of the local restaurants and it, when you're paying $1,000 a month to menu log, that obviously puts a lot of pressure on the business to be able to produce um, great food. The other component of it is is that there's nothing on menu log that helps a restaurant differentiate itself. You don't get the story. You know, what we should have been looking for, and, you know, I've learned my lesson. <laughs> We're definitely having Indian next week. From the restaurant that I know, and I know a bit about the chef, and I know that they cook a great vindaloo, what we should have been looking for is someone, you know, who's got an, uh, ran an American restaurant, he's emigrated out to Australia, he's got a smoker out the back, and the ribs are going to be absolutely epic, because he has ribs down to a fine art, not just some pizza place that's decided to do ribs as a bit of product expansion, don't really know how to do it, got no quality control, and probably don't even care. This was the sad part about it. What is your story? Tell that story a lot better and you will reap the benefits of it by getting more customers and being able to turn them into repeat customers. So there we go. If you take taken one thing out of this podcast, Google in an incognito window your own restaurant and see what comes up with it and, and make sure that you're happy with the results. If anyone's got problems with this, like transferring a domain name can be quite tricky. So just hit us up, more customers at marketingforrestaurants.com. Hit me up on LinkedIn, Facebook. We do this stuff all the time. The restaurant that we were dealing with, we're going through the process now of getting that domain transferred from Menulog, not to us, even though it's our website, not to us, to the restaurant owner. It's their website. It's their intellectual property. It's their story that they're trying to tell. They, they're the owner of the restaurant. They're the owner of the domain. You know, I think that's a really important thing for you to be looking at. So if you've got something out of today's podcast, please like and share it. Give us a good review in iTunes. That would be really appreciated. It really helps us to get the word out about the podcast. Thank you for everyone who has been a part of the journey for us to uh, the first 50 podcast episodes. My challenge is to get to the 100th episode in under another 50 weeks. So this week's been a pretty good week. I've done, this is my third podcast for the week and we've got a whole heap of really interesting guests coming up on the show. So thank you very much and I hope you have a really busy week. Bye. Want more customers for your restaurant, cafe or takeout? Every month, our marketing tools and information are used by thousands of restaurant owners just like you to help them find more customers and turn them into repeat customers. All of our tools and information is designed specifically for restaurant owners. We know you don't have a lot of time to spend marketing or learning complicated procedures, so our tools are quick and easy to use. If you're looking to increase your revenue and profits or want to work less hours, check out marketingforrestaurants.com